Welcome everyone. We're going to call the uh, school board meeting to order at 6.30 and we will start off with public comment. I see we have a few folks in the room um, and maybe online as well. Um, and just to make sure, we do also have a PAC agenda, so I'm, I'm going to have my little handy timer going um, to keep everybody in two minutes. Is there anyone who would like? Sure. And then um, just as also as a reminder, please make sure to state your name and town for the record. My name is Richard Shear, and I am from Montpelier, and my son Gabriel is on the first ultimate Frisbee team and recruited Ann Watson to coach. Um, I'm here tonight with a real simple proposition for the schools. And that's that uh, the city of Montpelier is right now considering locations for the recreation center. And I'm asking that the school at least offer up as an alternative an area next to the high school that would allow for the synergy of that facility and the high school. Right now, the present rec center is being overused by seniors because it's proximate to the senior center. During the day, uh, up on the edge of town, it would be seen by just a small number of parents of small children. Here you have the opportunity for a full gymnasium. And all you have to do is have it open at nights and allow for parking and on weekends. And I'm just saying, you don't have to make the decision, oh, we want it up here, but just tell the city that at least uh, we would be open to consideration. And that didn't take two minutes. But I would love for the school board to step forward because it would be a fantastic resource, potential resource. And again, I'm not asking for any kind of commitment whatsoever, except for to contact Bill and say, could you at least look? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. That's all. <laughs> Thanks so much. Just our practice and actually procedure is not to, we don't respond to public comment um, in meetings. So we just listen and um, express gratitude for you showing up. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do we have any other members of public who want to? Okay. Moving on to the consent agenda then. I move that we approve the consent agenda. Yeah. Second. Second. Any discussion? I would just like to appreciate the principal's report and she needs to go to the report. This is reveals how I'm feeling at this point in the day. Um, but thank you. It's just really to hear all the exciting things happening in the school. There's just like a lot of positive things to celebrate and just kind of taking into like the classrooms and student experiences, you know, bringing us in there with you is just really great. I appreciate, um, you know, I think there's some administrators that maybe don't get in the trenches and appreciate them that you're getting up to the schools. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Oh, I'm not supposed to vote. Uh, any opposed? Okay, great. So can we, we have one addition to the agenda, which is to just do a quick overview of the rest of the school year for board meetings. Um, keeping, so the plan for the school board is to hold one of our retreats more early-ish in the summer if we can given you know our schedule if our schedules line up and um, and then the second one to be closer to the end of the summer to the start of the coming school year and that the retreats would be uh, the first retreat would be to finally and fully land our priorities indicators of success and then goals for um, you know relative short-term like one to two year goals and then the second retreat would be to set up the work plan that would for the board that would facilitate us getting to those goals so i wanted to sh um, share with the board what the rest of our board meetings look like to um, get us to the point where we can have that conversation at the first retreat 
um, and what we'll be covering in the next um, upcoming board meetings with in mind, keeping in mind anything that the board needs to know in order to be able to land our priorities and indicators of success. And then also ask my fellow board members if there's anything missing from this list of this schedule that we should try and work in. So are you able to share your screen so it goes up there? Um, thank you. Make it bigger. Hold on. Is this the agenda planning document? Yes. Yeah, you yearly, all have this. Right. School board yearly calendar, or yeah, board yearly, yearly board calendar. So it's also kind of shocking to see how few meetings we have left until the end of the school year. But right, so for um, this tonight's meeting, we have the special ed presentation. Then in two weeks, we'll have the, the audit presentation, the results from the needs assessment. We have a um, presentation from Jim Birmingham, Birmingham on our um, school, our food service. We're gonna be doing an equity training, which is, um, and now I've lost what the dates are, but I think that's sometime in May. <laughs> it's the mid meeting in May. Mid May, yeah. Which will be um, around what the board's role is in closing the academic gap um, which is actually one of our um, priority areas. And then at the end of May, the um, middle school sustainability leadership group has asked to do a presentation to the board. Um, and then the um, June meeting, which happens I think mid-June, I think it's June 14th, mm -hmm. is when we will get the last of the um, data presentations for the school year from our administrators. So all of those are keeping in mind the um, themes that we've already identified for priorities for the board um, and the district, closing the academic gap, um, a community or an, an environment that fosters belonging, safety and wellness, and community engagement. Those are our three main themes. And with those in mind, this is what we've laid out so far, but also wanted to throw it out to board members to know if there's anything more that you would want to include in the lead up to the board retreat in order to be able to land our priorities and indicators of success. And you don't have to answer tonight because we're just putting all of this out there in front of you right now. But if, as you think about that question more over the next couple of days, please email Jim, Libby, and myself so that we can try and work it in. But also, if you have any thoughts right now, I'm happy to hear them and write them down and take note. And see how we can Ones that are there? Yeah, it's looking pretty good. Um, I just want to say, because we're at public meeting, that if anyone's listening, on May 3rd, I think it is, the May 3rd meeting, we're, um, we're looking at student applications for the next uh, student representative oh, right. position. So if anyone listening knows anybody who is a student in our district and is interested in being one of our student reps, Zach and Merrick are both graduating and moving on. Um, so we're going to need to be filling those positions and we'll be making that, those appointments on, I think it is May 3rd, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And what's the deadline in the process, if you wanna let folks know? Um, I have a document that I believe I shared with you. I'll make sure that it's out there. Uh, Matt McLean, so Matt McLean is sort of running the process. There's a document that outlines it's the same document pretty much. We've updated it from when Zach and Merrick applied. Um, but it's, I think it's April 27th is the deadline to email letters of interest. Um, I have my email address there and also Matt McLean's email address. So they can, I mean, they can send it to any of you and you can forward it to me. And I'll compile a list and then we'll be reviewing those um, letters of interest on May 3rd and then ultimately making an appointment, two appointments. How did those openings become known to students? So Matt McLean is, what is his the position? director of flexible pathways. He is very at high school. At the high school, yeah. He's very tied to the students um, and does a lot of this work with the kids. So I'm sure you brought an email blast to students. I believe. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Um, in the small and yeah. the yeah. updates. I don't know if it's in, if it's been in the Gator News yet, so I'll check the most recent Gator News. But it goes out into all of the school newsletters. It goes out directly to students via their email addresses. It's, it's, uh, it went out to um, leadership of student groups. 
so that they could potentially uh, let their, the students from their groups know. Um, but if you have any other ideas of how it should be put out there. I'll make sure to get that document to all the board members. That was an oversight on my part. All right, thanks. And then, yeah, if other requests or ideas for information um, come to you after this meeting is over, don't forget, just send us an email. We'll try and work it in. There's a, there's a policy recommended by the Vermont uh, School Board Association required, and it in, it's parent and family engagement related to Title I schools, and it's really, really massive, and it includes 30 different areas with prompts for community engagement and how that might happen. And we've talked about a uh, community engagement committee, and I'm, I'm, it's so large and, it, and it's so comprehensive that it will, for us to, for us to adopt the policy once we finally get there, it's gonna take a lot of collaboration with a lot of different levels in the, in the school district. And I don't know if there's a, a place or a process in a board meeting or another way to sort of begin to sort of consider how, because it, it's going to require potentially, and it's the community engagement committee that we talked about will probably be required to monitor all of the actions that are required by the state for uh, by the school board association. So it's a, it's a, I'm not sure where it fits into board meetings, uh, but it's a massive undertaking. And I think we do a lot of this, um, and this would formalize some of those processes. But I think it's gonna take a lot of collaboration. Um, so I don't know whether that fits in a board meeting or whether it's its own, that's a discussion of a new committee or repurposing of current views or what that might look like. But it sounds like we could use time with the retreat when talking about community engagement since we've already named it as a priority to figure out what that looks like. That's that's what we would be maybe we would use the policy as you know to help ground our indicators of success or something like that. I think, I think it'll guide as well. Is it okay if I just share the link to the whole board of the the draft? Well, the policies will go through three, I mean, there's a process for that, right? So, do you just need for information purposes just only, just so we can all take a look at it? I think scope. that's fine. Just so we, just not to you know, maybe, it, maybe share with them just to, to keep the open meeting, um, make sure that we're not violating open meeting. Yeah. yeah. Share the link from BSBA. Yeah. That's yeah. to the model policy, yeah. on which it. is, you know, just for people's information, we have three required policies. This is not on our agenda tonight, so we're kind of going off on a tangent. All right, I'm just trying to bring us back. Yes, <laughs> I, I think we, so I think we're in pretty good shape working on it, at drafting it in yeah. the policy committee, but I think working on it at the retreat or discussing it is a good idea. Yeah, yep, okay. And so in order for us to be able to do that effectively, it does sound like it would be useful for board members to read even the draft model policy from the SBA. <laughs> So that would be great. Thanks, Ray. Okay, so let's move on to Peggy Sue. You're up. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Of course. Okay, um, so I tried to put together some information about special education to kind of give an overview and provide some detail, but not too much detail. Um, so hopefully this meets what you all were hoping, uh, or what you were looking for. Whoops. Um, so, Libby, you're going to be my Vanna? Yeah. Okay. All right, you can skip that one. <laughs> okay. So, um, when we think about students with disabilities, there are three federal laws that um, we that encompass most of the work that we do, and so I'm not going to go into them in great detail, but I wanted to just identify what those are. So. We have um, IDEA, which is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Um, that is what special education rules fall under and laws fall under. Um, that was reauthorized in 2004 and uh, most recently amended in 2015. Um, there's the Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 19. 
1973, and then the um, American with Disability Act of 1990. And so I'm going to just briefly talk about those to just put some context. Next. Oh, there we go. Thanks. So IDEA um, is, oops, I'm going to do it on my screen too, because um, <laughs> I can't see that. <laughs> um, is um, an entitlement law that um, provides individuals with rights to receive a benefit from the law. So um, a quote from the law, which I think just kind of summarizes its purpose, um, disability is a natural part of the human experience and in no way diminishes the rights of individuals to participate in or contribute to society. Improving educational results for children with disabilities is an essential element of our national policy of ensuring equality of opportunity, full participation, independent living, and economic self-sufficiency for individuals with disabilities. So again, this is where the federal laws um, around special education services, services come, and we'll talk more about that. Um, the next law, <coughs> Section 504, um, is something that actually started um, because of Vietnam vets, um, and it's an anti-discrimination law. And it's really about making sure that we're not um, that we're not discriminating discriminating against people with disabilities, and we're making sure they have equal access um, to participate in and benefit from any programs that uh, receive federal assistance. And then ADA, which came in 1990, <coughs> is also anti-discrimination and basically extended those protections. Um, to um, include things that don't necessarily require um, or get federal financial assistance. So um, those are the three federal laws. So in Vermont, um, we have the Vermont Special Education Rules, um, which we, that are taken from the federal law. We have to follow the federal laws at a minimum. And then in Vermont, there are some things that are obviously different um, that I'll talk a little bit about. Um, these rules were most recently updated in July of last year, although some parts have been um, delayed and will be implemented this coming July um, because there was a concern in the field that people weren't ready for the changes, some of the changes. Um, so those rules were open because the funding for special education had changed, so they had to open them up for that, and when they did that, um, there were opportunities for public comment and also um, the people at the Agency of Ed to think about best practices and things that had been learned um, since the last time they were opened, and so there were a lot of changes that were made. Some of the most significant changes um, were around special education eligibility, uh, so there's a lot of um, change around what specific learning disability looks like and determining that. That isn't coming in effect until July uh, this year. Um, there are some changes around adverse effects, and I'm going to talk about these things more in detail. Um, which also is not until July. Um, they changed the definition of specially designed instruction and who can provide it. That one is currently in effect. Uh, functional skills has been added as a basic skill area. We'll talk about that more in, as we go through. And there are also more specific opportunities for parental input. So parents obviously have always been a big part of it, but now there are specific um, places where you're documenting clearly um, the input of parents. So, specially designed instruction. That is really what special education is about. Um, this is the definition of it. Uh, I'm not going to read it all to you, but the, the two parts that I want to highlight is that it, the purpose of specially designed instruction is to address the unique needs of the child that results from their disability and to ensure access that that child has access to the gen ed curriculum. So um, that they can work towards meeting the same standards that all students should be meeting or, or asked or hope that we're hoping to have them meet. Okay. Oops, my so how does a student become <coughs> eligible for special education in Vermont? Currently there are three gates. I don't know where the word gates came from, but that is how we tend to talk about it. Um, in Vermont that need to be met for a student to qualify for special education. So we have to look at disability, we have to look at the adverse effect of that disability, and then is there a need for specialized instruction. So the first gate is does a, a child have a disability? This is a list of the categories of disability that are in the federal and the Vermont rules. Um, with each of these categories, there are specific criteria and questions that you need to answer. 
um, to make that determination around whether or not um, a child qualifies under this disability category. Um, I did put a note on here, there's a lot of conversation around <coughs> dyslexia. Dyslexia is listed as one of the conditions that fall under specific learning disability. So if a child is diagnosed with dyslexia, their special education paperwork is going to say specific learning disability because that's what the category, category is in the Vermont reg. So they're, for the purpose of special education, they're kind of the same terms, but the, the term that is um, used in the regs is specific learning disability. So. so if a student has a disability, then a team needs to decide, does that disability have an adverse effect on their educational performance? Currently in Vermont, and I say currently because it's changing after July, um, the way that adverse effect is defined is you have to look at the lowest 15th percentile rank it just gets into a lot of things. Lowest 15th percentile rank compared to same grade peers in at least one basic skill area, and the basic skill areas are up there, that you can show with three pieces of evidence, three different pieces of evidence, and there are six categories of evidence. It's a very complex, <laughs> it's, it's a lot. But anyway, that's what it is right now. So right now, we have to look at, compared to other students in the same grade, is there an adverse effect and it's demonstrated by this. After July 1, the 15th percentile rank is going away. Um, there's no longer a specified a number of pieces of evidence you need, nor is there specified types of evidence you need. Um, functional skills is being added as a basic skill area. So right now, when you look at the basic skill areas, they're all academic in nature. Um, functional skills is one that's being added. Um, and reading fluency is being removed um, from this list after July. Uh, the reason reading fluency is being removed is because right now in the regs, reading fluency can only be looked at for a basic skill area if the primary disability is specific learning disability. After July, specific learning disability is no longer going to be required to look at adverse effect. So, <laughs> so this is where I'm like, how much do I share? Like, like it gets barely, but anyway. So, Can you say that last sentence again? <laughs> no, I don't know what I said. <laughs> yeah. so, after, so, so after July, yeah. specific learning disability and actually deaf blindness are two areas that the rules have changed so the teams no longer have to look at adverse effect in determining eligibility. So it doesn't need that second gate. It doesn't need the second Only gate. Only the one. Right. And the, the, the first third? gate, the third gate still has to be, yes. Okay. The first gate for specific learning disability has gotten much broader and really like it's the adverse effects is kind of built into the process that you're going to have to do to look at specific learning disability. So that's why that's removed. And so the reading, reading fluency, the reason reading fluency is removed is because at, right now it's only for a specific learning disability. And the general idea here is that it's going to make it a little easier to identify if someone needs. Um, not necessarily no. easier. Um, I think it's just a more, so you mean why are they pulling away the adverse effect? Yeah. That's a good question. So it used to be there wasn't the 15th percentile rank um, criteria. It was just <clears throat> is the disability impact having an adverse impact? And so there are lots of pay p ways people looked at it, and I think they were trying to um, make things more consistent across schools with, le with less um, room for interpretation. Mm -hmm. So they put this 15th percentile rank in, and they, and they talked about functional skills also needing to be considered, but not as a separate area. And so their goal of being more consistent didn't actually happen because I think people still, some people were really hard and fast with 15th percentile and didn't necessarily, people interpreted the functional skills part differently. So their, I think their goal of being more consistent actually didn't end up being more consistent. And so I don't know why they're going back. <laughs> but that, that's kind of the, the history of it, because we didn't have 15th percentile. 
Um, Vermont is one of the only states that had that, so that was like more restrictive than the federal definition and guidelines. And so I think maybe they're trying to align more with the federal guidelines. I'll just like, add in that this is a significant shift for our special educators and psychologists and who've been doing training with a woman named Jen Patno mm -hmm. and the rest of the state for mm -hmm. the last few weeks or you and through here for um, We were just talking about it. Um, for across the spring, winter and spring, um, but it is a, a significant change for our special education department. And I will also say that the Agency of Education has not provided much guidance as to how to do this change, which is the reason why those organizations bring to that. I think there was a high And we're offering it as a recorded option as well. <laughs> if anybody needs to access it, they can purchase it. Awesome. Um, so yes. I think I heard you say that um, Vermont used to not have the 15% mm -hmm. and that many, most states also don't have it. Right. And so I'm just curious, you, what what about it is so significant for? Because it's a different way to identify students. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So wait, can I answer this? Because yeah, the, the, there's two big significant. One of the things is the adverse effect that's really significant. The other really significant change is the way that specific learning disability is looked at, which is a lot of what we've done in those trainings. So there had been an option, um, and many places um, in Vermont used what was called the discrepancy model. So you looked at a student's cognitive level, you looked at their academic achievement level, and if there was a gap of a certain range, then you said that because of this discrepancy that a, a student had a specific learning disability. Now they're taking that discrepancy model away. So it used to be plug the numbers into the computer, figure, you know, that. That now no longer is an option, and so what it, the, Wording is around, um, and I'm gonna, I don't know the exact wording of the law, but basically what we're looking at now is looking at cognitive um, patterns of strengths and weaknesses and or a response to intervention model to look at learning disabilities and determine that. And so that requires us to look at, um, to, it, it becomes a little grayer in a sense, which again, but it's more, um, I would say it's probably more genuine to really understanding um, children and how they learn and digging deeper into um, the way their brains work versus being able to give tests and plug in numbers and make a thing. So that I would say is the biggest change probably is that for a lot of districts in Vermont, um, especially districts without school psychologists, um, that um, that was a that's that's a big change. We are. So happy to have school psychologist next year because she is going to be critical in making sure that we're doing this in a way um, that you know with her expertise is going to be great. So that is a big change, and then the adverse effect part is a big change because it's not as clear cut with that just that again that mathematical. Um, so um, yeah. And and the board will recognize the response to intervention piece that we have to show. We have to show evidence of that. So all the work we've been doing around the tier three in particular yeah. systems, um, particularly our elementary schools, is going to be key, really key yeah. to this process. Right. So if we're in order for us to determine that a student has a specific learning disability, we have to essentially prove that they had really good first instruction, that they had additional like a sec second dip of that first instruction, that then we did intervention, that then you know like that they're not responding to all of these things, and that our interventions are getting more targeted and more focused on how they learn as individual students. Yeah, for those of you who've been on the board for a while, that should sound familiar, right? Because <laughs> that's what we've been working to create. Yeah. Can I ask two quick questions? Yeah. Um, am I picking up on that this is a challenging but not necessarily bad change overall? Are we, are we happy with this change? Are special educators happy with this change, or is this problematic? I don't think it's problematic. I think it's a different way of working. Um, and I think it's, there, there is um, a concern, not because they don't want to meet kids' needs, but that there is going to be a significant increase in the referrals, which we already have this year. <laughs> um, and also, you know, so the grayer things are, the more difficult it is to make sure that we are, you know, um, 
following what we need to follow, kids are getting what they need to get. It just, it, I think it's uncomfortable because it's new and people want to make sure that we're doing it right. Um, and the, one of the things that's interesting is the state hasn't said you need to do it this way. They've said you can choose by the district. So it doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be more consistency between school districts because every district is kind of figuring out how they're going to do it. And then my other, thank you. My yeah. other just quick question was, does this have any impact on students that are already at some point in their education? Like, do students that are already under a plan, for example, have to have it revisited? No, 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 no. So, okay. um, when you are um, when you receive special education services, there's a requirement that every three years you have a reevaluation to determine if there's still that need of service. So, as people's reevaluation dates come up there could be a change in what that process looks like for students. And part of what the new law also says is there's more um, ability to say, like, we already know this kid has a disability. We don't need to keep checking that part. So it's really that conversation about need. So there might be less um, repeat of testing that we've probably done every three years for a while because now we can look and say, yep, we still all agree that based on the way they're presenting in the school that this disability category makes sense. So now we just need to talk about, is there still a need for specialized instruction? OK. So there we go. The third gate is that need question. So if a student has a disability that is adversely impacting their educational performance, then the team talks about, for gate three, is there a need? Do they require something specialized that's not provided through the system of supports for all students? And so. If they say, if, if a team says yes to all three of those gates, then a student is eligible for special education. Um, and then there's the note, which we already talked about, just that after July, um, that specific learning disability and deaf blind no longer have to look at adverse effect. The specific learning disability, um, you know, it's just, it's more built in, and deaf blind, I think, it's just a no brainer. <laughs> like, if you're deaf and blind, there's likely an adverse effect, and you're going to need some special education. Um, so, once that happens, then a team gets together to develop an individual education program or an IEP. Um, IEPs are developed as a team. There are required team members, and that's the list there. So you need a special educator, classroom teacher, your caregivers, obviously, um, the student um, when appropriate, an LEA representative, which is someone from the school district who can make decisions about resources. Um, and then related service providers um, as appropriate and other people with knowledge. So if there are other people that the caregivers or that, that work with the student that the um, team feels like would be important to have their input, then they would come to the meeting. Um, IEPs are reviewed at least annually and updated. Um, there are several components to IEPs. So you talk about the present level. So what is the student? educational performance, what do they look like functionally, um, what is the impact of their disability, what are their strengths, their needs, um, if there's medical information that's important <coughs> for um, teams to know. And this, this document is really about creating a plan that is information for anyone working with the students in the schools as well as obviously the parents, but really um, you know, making sure that <coughs> this is information so that someone working with a student has a good picture of the student and the impact of their disability. Um, there is a new parent input uh, section that uh, is on the IEP that's currently started, that started last July, that is just a place to really be clear about what the parents want to make sure is in that plan. Um, and then you identify <laughs> goals and objectives. Uh, for the student and then think about what services the students needs in order to meet those goals that have been identified. Um, we talk about accommodations and modifications. I'll talk a little bit more about what those are. And then for students who are um, turning 16 or older, you, there's a post-secondary transition plan requirement. So we have a requirement to work with students in high school um, and identifying what they want to do after high school and then looking at what do we need to do while they're in high school to help them work towards those goals. And so there's a requirement around making sure that we are uh, working with community partners and that kind of stuff to make sure that students are set up for what they want to do after high school, which not <coughs> many 15-year-olds know what they want to do. So that's always fun to, to work on those plans. Um, <laughs> there's also an independent living component part of that. So it's work, looking at um, education, at work, and then at independent living. And so really making sure that we are 
um, providing students what they need. Um, and then, uh, oh, I just made a note that when we're thinking about IEPs, that we're really thinking and um, identifying the impact of the disability. That's what we're really looking at and trying to address through an IEP. Questions about that? That was a lot. Okay. Uh, just a couple key terms to think about um, with, in special education. So we talk about accommodations a lot. Accommodations are how a student is going to access the curriculum and demonstrate their learning. So they're about removing the barriers that are preventing the student from fully accessing that. So examples might be um, untimed assessments, getting copies of class notes, having less problems on a math page, something like that. So it's really about the access. Modifications are about changes to what the student is expected to learn. So accommodations are not looking to change what is happening as far as the content. Modifications um, could mean that we're changing what we're asking the student to learn. So um, a couple examples, like if a class is working on writing paragraphs to express themselves, an individual student might be working on writing a sentence to express themselves. Um, or uh, classes learning like standard units of measurement for weight and length, and an individual student could be learning heavy versus light, long versus short. So looking at what is the grade level um, expectation and then kind of backing that out to where is the student right now and making sure that that's how they're accessing that content. Um, and then least restrictive environment is um, something that is in special education law. And um, it basically says that students are required to be educated with their non-disabled peers to the fullest extent possible. A child with a disability should not be removed from education in their age-appropriate classroom solely because of the need for modifications. So um, just because they're not learning exactly what's being taught in that class is not a reason that then they should be pulled from those classes. Um, so important note with least restrictive environment, we always start with the regular classroom, but that's not the least restrictive environment for all students based on what their needs are and you know what they're what we need to provide them. Thank you, Sue. Yes. How does this work? So it with like my kids are in elementary school, so with specials, right? Um, how do the the teachers for specials integrate into the IEP? or is there integration of them into the team? So all of the teachers who work with students um, get copies of IEPs and um, generally it's near to impossible to get every teacher at a meeting and so special educators would be reaching out to teachers ahead of time to get their input if there was something specific um, that they felt like need, they needed to make sure we talked about in the meeting, mm -hmm. but all of the special teachers have those and have the obligation to do the accommodations and modifications as required. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and then I'm going to imagine the complexity um, oh. scales as you get into middle and high school. For so. sure. Well, even, right, even elementary school, right? right? Like just the number of kids with plans um, gets pretty, yeah. I have some thoughts in my my brain of how to help. We've been talking a lot on our leadership team about our, our uh, North Star being a list of things that happen in every single classroom and MRPS that we can like guarantee like every single teacher does all of these best practices and therefore these things don't have to be in plans so that then the, the plans actually are smaller and more manageable. But we'll get there. Um, okay. So switching gears a little, Section 504 we talked about, that's the um, anti-discrimination law. Um, people who are protected under Section 504, um, people with, who have or have, are suspected of having, so if we believe somebody has a physical or mental impairment, which substantially limits one or more major life activities. Those are the people that are protected. And this is not just a school-based thing. This is, stu we have many Section 504 plans for students, but this is um, a workplace law as well. So um, mental or physical impairment, um, we don't often, th there's not a lot of testing necessarily done by the school districts around Section 504 plans. Generally, we are getting information from um, PCP for physicians or counselors or things like that about students coming in. Um, not to say that there aren't times when we do assessments for that, um, but generally it's often information we're getting from some outside provider. Um, there is a team decision-making process around this, 
but it doesn't have the like you have to meet every year all those best practice and we do that but there's not all of the strict um, procedural things necessarily that special education has uh, substantially limiting is not defined in the law um, the office of civil rights is the agency that oversees this law um, and they have given us something to consider they say that the effect of the impairment on the major life activity is measured by comparing the individual's ability to that of an average person in the general population. Um, major life activities are everything from learning to using the bathroom to breathing, like the list, I don't know what's not a major life activity, like it's a really long list of things for people to consider. Um, and so the purpose of a Section 504 plan is to remove the barriers to access. So it's about leveling the playing field, so it's the accommodations we talked about. Um, students with a Section 504 plan would not have modified curriculum because that would be special education. So this, this is really about like what are the things we need to do to support their access. Um, I put a note on here um, because I think it's important that you can have a disability or impairment and you may not be protected under this law. Um, and they did note that a student with an impairment who's succeeding in regular education cannot be viewed as substantially limited in the area of learning. So there's not, this isn't like a door prize that you get if you, like, there, you know, there are a lot of conditions that people may have um, that may not, that, that may be considered a physical or mental impairment, but not, may not substantially limit something enough that you'd be protected under this law. So there still is a process and the team really needs to consider the impact of that disability to decide if someone's protected under that law. Any yeah, this is a, it's something that's not defined by law. Does that mean that it's going to be interpreted very differently across districts? And does it mean that? <laughs> and across Welcome to education. And, and, <laughs> yes. and does it mean that there's disagreement among special educa educators and disagreement between educators and caregivers? And Thank you for saying caregivers, that. Can caregivers push? really hard if they're of the belief that this is going to help and that kind of push somebody over the line to get a 504 because there's no way to rebut it or so there's always a way to rebut it and we certainly want to work with caregivers um, one of the things I should say section 504 is actually a general education law it's not special education it is about people with disabilities but it's general education so um, we happen to have a special educator at the high school who oversees Section 504, but in the uh, other schools, are, it's the school counselors that are the 504 case managers, so I just want to say that. And yes, so one of the things that's really important is to have um, a caregiver be a part of that conversation because we may not be seeing the impact in the way that you are at home, and so really making sure that we're having those conversations. Um, one of the things that we ask, so more than once in my 26 years have I gotten like a doctor's little notepad that just says Johnny has ADHD, give him a 504 plan. That's not helpful. So like what I want to know is how is ADHD manifesting in Johnny? Like what are the things that we should be looking for to address? Because that's what we need to figure out, right? Like so great he has ADHD, but what does that look like? for him and then what are the barriers that we need to remove so if we're able to identify barriers then absolutely we're going to have a plan i don't i mean i think that there yeah and then you know the, uh, the office of civil rights not that that's where you want to go please come see me first but um you know if you had some kind of concern or you know we're feeling like you know this was something that you, you really felt like your child needed um and you know had information that backed that up then we would have that conversation and figure it out um, the other thing that's important to know is that um, the SAT company we have no control over what they do for accommodations and so um, a lot of students when they get to high school people are looking for them to have accommodations on those tests and all we can do is send in what we have and then they make those decisions likewise when you go to college you can take Special education ends the day you graduate from high school. Section 504 is something that can go into the workplace and go into you know, college, etc. But again, that's about what the college decides. Like we don't like we us writing a plan doesn't guarantee that like that's what's going to happen in college. Um, so sometimes there are more requests in high school. I think because people are getting nervous about leaving the protections of like the smaller place where their kids are known or whatever. And so um, yeah. 
Does that answer your question? Kind of. Um, I mean, there's, there's, right. I mean, I think it's the conversation, right? It's, uh, it, yeah, there isn't a clear, like, the 15th percentile thing, right? Like, that's, um, but if, I would say, like, we're not going, there's no reason for us not to provide a student a 504 plan if there is a need for it. Like, it doesn't, you know, because there's not services attached to it. Like, it's not going to, I mean, there's just, and we, not that that's why we would make decisions anyway, but, like, there's, like, if a student needs that support and that access, we're going to figure out how to get that to them. I didn't answer your question. Though. No, I think so. Okay. I think so. The, the difference is the, 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 essentially the resources needed to meet the plan. This is something that you can share with a classroom teacher, and you don't need to have a special educator right. necessarily providing the right. instruction or supplementing the right. instruction. The only types of services that generally would, that I've seen in 504 plans would be things like um, if there's a teacher of the deaf who's providing some kind of consultation or, uh, you know, things like that. But for the most part, there's not generally services. It really is about just the access part. Got it. Yeah. yeah. And all of, both, all of these plans also go into any um, after school, anything that the school facilitates. So if there's students, if your child is on a sports team that's run by the school, then um, the Section 504 plan should be shared and that kind of stuff. You know what concerns me a little bit about this is the vagueness of the J.E. or the, that the things are a little more vague, it seems. Um, that could just be me. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I think they're loosening up or they're more open to interpretation is how I'm feeling about what you're describing. And so, uh, um, we all know that it's expensive, right? And I would really hope that schools, and especially our school, wouldn't cut back on services because we didn't have to provide them or we couldn't interpret them in a oh, way. Oh, yeah, that, no. I, you know we're I'm not saying? doing that. And I, I guess the other thing I should say is because there is, there are things that districts have to um, make decisions about, one of the things that we will be doing, we just haven't got there yet, is creating more processes and procedures about this. So in Montpelier, this is how we're going to look at adverse effect. This is how we're going to make determination about specific learning disability. Um, and that's work that the team that's been going to those trainings are going to do. And then with our new school psychologist, we're going to, we need her expertise in that. Um, so we will be coming up with like procedures around this stuff so that there is some consistency. Um, that's actually something that I've been doing despite all of this, is just trying to create more consistency for families and students so it's not dependent on which person you're working with or what school you're at or whatever, so that there feels like a more consistent experience because there aren't necessarily a lot of procedures and processes that go across the district at this point. Okay. I think we're getting there. Okay, so just real quickly, how do they overlap? They're both for students with disabilities. They both focus on the impact of disability. They're both federal laws with protections. Um, and I want to point out that just because a student is behind or struggling doesn't mean they have a disability. And so there are requirements um, that, well, one, that's why we have our multi-tiered system of support, so that all kids are getting what they need, and it's not based on just those who have a disability. But it's also um, important, and one of the things that we have to do, especially if we're looking at specific learning disability, is we have to rule out all the other factors before we can say that a student has a disability, uh, learning disability. So things like attendance, or disrupted schooling, or um, lack of you know, first instruction that's high quality. So like, for example, I went to a different school every year until I was in high school, so I missed geography, like, because there wasn't a consistent curriculum somewhere, so along the way, I missed it, right? So looking at, you know, if we have a student who has been to a bunch of schools, for example, and they're struggling to read, we need to provide them some really clear reading instruction before we're going to say that this child has a disability so that we can rule out the fact that this just, it isn't that they, have a disability, but that they just haven't had the opportunity to learn yet. So, um, yeah, just do that. So, uh, what does special education look like in Montpelier? So, we make decisions about student needs and services as IEP teams. We always start with the general education classroom um, to ask, can we do that specially designed instruction there? Um, 
if we can, it might look like the special educator co-planning with the classroom teacher and the teacher providing the service. It could look like the special educator and the teacher providing the instruction together. So just examples. Um, teams talk about does it need to happen in a separate space due to student specific reasons. And I want to highlight that due to student specific reasons. So if we are pulling kids out, it's not because it works better for the adult schedules. It's because that's what that student needs. Um, so for example, many students need a quiet, quiet environment to get that really targeted instruction. So we would think about that. And then we look at um, can it be done in a small group or does it need to be individual? So if we're thinking about being restrictive, individual is more restrictive than small group. So if we can do it in a small group, that is our preference. Um, and then what are the skills that the professional who's providing that instruction need to have? Um, <clears throat> so specially designed instruction should be provided by a professional. Um, in the law, it says IAs can do it in rare cases if it's under the guidance of a special educator, like that doesn't make sense because we need the professionals to be able to in the moment respond to what they're seeing the student provide or give them um, based on their professional knowledge. Um, so it has to be by professional and then teams also talk about how much time do they, does the service need to be in order for the student to progress towards the goals that have been identified. Um, a note here. Students should not be pulled from their grade level of first instruction for specially designed instruction. So special education is supplemental to first instruction, not a replacement for it. Just a side note on this, the, the school board is getting a presentation on our ability challenge audit. We got a lot of good feedback around this in particular. Um, so you'll hear a lot of where we need to grow and where our opportunities for, for doing this better at the next board meeting. Having kids stay in the classroom, is that the this you're talking about? Uh, this process, like what oh. does specialized instruction look like at, at MRPS um, and where are opportunities to grow our capacity here. We got a lot of really great feedback around that. Yeah, I'm excited to do this and that'd be great. Um, so just kind of continuing what does it look like at Montpelier. So we have some students that get the push-in in-class services, either individually or small group. Um, some get pull-out services um, individually or small group, so those are out of class. We have classes that are co-taught um, by gen ed teachers with special educators. We have students accessing services through the Sunshine programs, Rise, Shine, and Thrive, which are SEL programs. Um, and then we have students whose least restrictive environment and where they're getting their specialized instruction is in therapeutic independent schools that are outside our district. Currently, the people providing special education services um, in Montpelier, special educators, math and literacy interventionists um, are doing services. We have speech language pathologists doing it, and then school social workers, counselors, and other SEL professionals are doing the special education services that are focused on the social emotional learning part. I have a clarifying question. Yeah. The math and literacy interventionists, mm -hmm. they obviously would be aware of the like the IEP plan, mm -hmm. for example, and do they have special education backgrounds? So the um, they have specialty in the areas that they are right. intervening. Right. So in some cases, they actually have more specialized training than maybe special educators who are more generalist. And so that's part of the conversation that IEP teams have around like what is the skill set that someone needs. We try not to pull them too much because if we pull them all to special education, we kind of ruin our great system that Mike and Libby have been working on for the last several years. Right, having uh, them at the tier three. Yes. Yeah. For even kids who don't have a disability. Right. Yeah. 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 So, so there's some of that happening, but that is definitely um, not what you know, not what our preference is. And we're, I'm working with Mike and the principals next year and looking at kind of with our the change in how special education funding worked really works. Um, really being able to look at even maximizing that more. So there might be special educators providing intervention, you know, like really looking at how do we maximize the resources that we have and the um, specialties that we have. Yeah, just because somebody's a special educator does not mean they're an expert in all the needs a kid has, right? Yeah. So I have a special education degree and I would, I would have been considered a great person to work with somebody with like the reading needs, the social emotional learning, or um, kids with really significant multiple intensive needs. I know much of you know, like I would not have been your girl <laughs> for, for that kind of thing. So 
that that's actually one of the best parts about the law change and the funding change is that we can really match expertise to the need. Um, the next slide it just talks a little bit about related services, just because if it's something you've heard. So, um, in addition to special education services, oftentimes there are students that require related services. And those are services that they need to benefit from their special education services. So um, we have students that get occupational therapy support, um, physical therapy, speech therapy, counseling, um, audiology, there's a whole list here. Um, if a student only requires a related service, then they cannot be determined to be eligible for special education. So it's just a to go down that rabbit hole but just so you know um, so what's in the works for what I've been doing and working on um, working on like I said creating systems and processes to try to increase our alignment between schools and practitioners um, working on looking at our allocation of resources to make sure that we are just they're distributed based on student need and not just like we've always had this person at the school therefore that's where they need to be um, PD opportunities, professional development for special educators and classroom teachers around um, differentiating instruction and growing instructional practices. And then working with Mike and Jess um, to enhance our MTSS system so that system of support um, and providing PD um, to increase understanding about disabilities. Um, things that were still to come. Um, Opportunities for parent training and involvement, um, rolling out the needs assessment. So um, we've been doing that. We're doing that with our staff right now and ahead of it coming out in public and to the board. Um, so and then identifying and confirming our priorities based on that information. And um, I know one of the things that uh, the board has asked for that I'm still racking my brain around is um, how do we measure overall success for special education? Um, we have a new system of called Panorama next year that I haven't gotten into too much, but I'm hoping there's some data thing there that maybe will help with that. Um, and then there's just, there were a couple of board member questions I want to address. Um, one was asking why Vermont doesn't require screening of all students for dyslexia. Um, so I did a little bit of research. Um, sounds like Vermont is one of 10 states that doesn't require it. Um, and I don't know why our legislator doesn't require it, but um, what I can say is that we have a number of common assessments that we do in Montpelier and Roxbury um, to make sure that we are looking at developing um, where students are at in developing their reading skills. So um, assessments that look at letter sound identification, high frequency words, phonological awareness, developmental spelling. There are a number of things that we're doing um, to make sure that we are you know, catching students early if they're struggling with that reading development. Um, there were a number of questions about the role of gen ed teachers with students who receive special education services. Um, this is my new mantra that I'm gonna put at the bottom of my email. Um, all students are general education students. Some general education students also require special education in order to fully access their education. So um, that, I think that's a pretty strong understanding and belief of people um, in the district from what I've seen. Um, but that is always really important to, to clarify that all students start out as gen ed students and then some need a little more. That's a little tickler from the audience. Uh, wait, that's oh. my next slide. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yeah, geez. Um So classroom teachers um, have a mandate to make sure that um, all students have access to the general ed curriculum regardless of disability. Um, they are required to implement accommodations and modifications as described in IEPs. They are required members of evaluation and IEP teams. Um, teachers collaborate uh, on a regular basis and co-plan with special educators. So the teachers are more the content experts and the special educators are the access experts. So that's why that co-planning is so important. Um, and then teachers track and provide data about student progress in their gen ed curriculum and share observations about how they see students' disabilities impacting them. And as Libby was trying to say, <laughs> spoiler alert, um, so, so at the next board meeting, um, the folks from Ability Challenge will be here um, and many of the questions that were answered or were asked will be answered through their, um, their report. Um, this is what Libby was going to say. Um, one of the quotes that we were really excited about was that the MRPS community is its greatest asset. 
Leaders and teachers believe in foundational mindsets of authentic inclusion. Students are thoughtful, curious, and eager to learn, and families are incredibly dedicated to ensuring that their children get the services they need. Um, they loved our students. They really enjoyed spending time with our students, which was great to hear. Um, and you know, I will say that it felt, um, it was great, the needs assessment was great and really confirmed for our team. I think that we're on the right track with the work that we have identified as priorities. And I always appreciate having data to agree with what I think. <laughs> <laughs> and what I was going to say, oh. we have the belief, the foundational belief yes. of, a, of strong inclusion, which is a huge hurdle that we've been working on. And we have a lot of work to do as to how to actually do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So a lot of capacity building and in specialized instruction mm -hmm. and when we give that and what it looks like and, and that kind of thing. So that, you know, the the belief is sometimes the harder part, yeah. honestly. Um, so I was super excited to see that, and, and we just got really good information. So I'm excited for the board to hear from Kristen and Sarah. Sarah, I can never remember Sarah's name. And I have to say, when you get the report, if you print it for some reason, the eyes, cool. no, it wasn't. It, they printed it in the middle school, too. Some of the eyes don't print in the report, even though they're on the digital copy. And Paula actually figured out it's after the letter F. Anytime there's an F, for some reason, the I after it doesn't print. So just know that on the, the report you get, they're all in there. But for some reason, when you print, I don't know why. Just, She's been obsessed about this. I, I had to go through and write in all the I's in my report because it was driving me crazy. How many pages is this report? It's like C8. No. Yeah. Oh, goodness. It's great. You it's added I's yeah. after every Well, F. as I was reading, yeah, I see. Just, you know, I had to. All right, I think that was it for me. Thank you Questions? very much. Thank you for being here. Yeah. And, and I mean, we're going to ask you to come back, I, I think, in a couple weeks, too. <laughs> there is a, appreciate you spending all this time with us to, to give the board this kind of information. For me, it was really helpful to be able to then make meaning of what we're going to see in a couple of weeks to have this foundational understanding. So really appreciate the time you put into that. Follow-up questions? Info? Emma. Um, yeah, thank you. This is, it's a lot to, I mean, you know, this is a really comprehensive overview of how things function. And I've sat through a lot of trainings as a fly on the wall. And I think that this is really, really well done. So thank you for that. Um, I'm also, you know, one of the notes that I wrote down and then was glad to see in your presentation is some sort of like parental involvement. Yeah. I think that any time that there's a change to how things are done, it can create anxiety for people for sure. and concerns. And I think, um, you know, some of those concerns were brought up uh, by Lynn. Um, you know, it can kind of go either way, like are too many kids get qualifying or are we using the discretion to qualify too many kids or we're using the discretion to like deny kids services. And I think those concerns are gonna be raised by the community. And so I think if we can kind of get out ahead of that in some way with, and it seems like you're already thinking about that, but. Yeah, I mean, I think we have to figure out what our procedures are and, and then. Yes, absolutely look for opportunities to, um, to, to share that with parents, um, yes, that's in, and other practices too, right? Just there are things this year that you know we've discovered. Like I, this is what happened when I was yeah. last year for me, and it didn't happen this year. So I assume that one of these people isn't doing their job right, and they're both doing their job right just differently. So trying to get more consistency, so there isn't that feeling of you know. I mean, this is your your children, right? It's your most precious thing. So yeah. we want to make sure that parents know that we are there teaming with them and, you know, we're going to do what we need to do for their kids. Yeah. So. And thanks for taking the initiative too. It sounds like um, developing, you know, district wide procedures and sort of a clarity and transparency around the way that this district interprets and, and works with the, within the law is yeah. going to be very helpful, I think. Thank Go you. for it. <laughs> um, I feel like when any sort of law change happens, there's a new initiative, it lands in different ways for different people. And I'm curious how these changes, and maybe some of them are anticipated, because it sounds like these have sort of been like way late a year yes. to kind of get ready. But um, like, where is there excitement? Where is there like trepidation, you know, in these new, maybe 
neither of those things <laughs> exist, but it certainly sounds like it's going to change your change how you do work, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I'm just curious, like where there might be excitement or trepidation within the um, within the special education world, and then most importantly, I'm curious what your opinion on is where this where these changes are going to benefit students. Um, so I think that there. Some of the things that are exciting, um, which Libby referenced a little bit, is with the funding changes, with there being more flexible um, funding around special education, there's more opportunity for us to collaborate and team and really look at how we use all the resources in the school instead of like this student needs special education services, it has to be with a special educator, you know. So like opportunities for really looking at what are the skill sets of our professionals and kind of um, maximizing our uh, what we are getting from them uh, that sounds terrible but you know what I mean um, so I think kids that get from what well, the kids yes well that's what I mean yes um, so I think there's exciting opportunity around teaming um, Mike and I have been doing a lot of work together and Jess although um, Jess is isn't quite as it's more focused on the SEL than the academics but Mike and I have been thinking about how we can use our academic resources in a way to really maximize opportunities for kids um, so I think that's exciting. Um, I think that I'm very excited to have a school psychologist. Um, I had one in my last district, and they just have an expertise that um, really is crucial. And there's a big difference between um, contracting with someone who comes in and does testing and gives a report and someone who can be at the meetings, who can consult with the teams after and really help people um, understand how kids' brains are working or you know, what is the information that they're able to dig in to. Um, I think that the trepidation, I think that people are doing a lot of great work but not necessarily having documented, like I think about classroom teachers, there's a lot of um, documentation requirement around some of this at those levels that they're, already, they're doing the work but aren't necessarily documenting, it's just built into how they practice. And so that part probably is going to feel uncomfortable and take some like getting used to it and feeling like they're under a microscope, right? Um, and so I think that that's a hard place for teachers to work, anyone to work, right? If you feel like you're under a microscope and you're, everything you're doing is being judged and you have to, like that doesn't feel great. So um, I imagine there will be some trepidation there with that. Um, I think the functional skills piece is something that's really uh, important. I think there's a lot of advocacy from people with children with autism um, because there are a number of people with autism who didn't necessarily hit that 15th percentile academically, the lowest 15th percentile, but that there's a need and so those needs have been um, address mostly through Section 504, and now there will be more um, opportunities for direct instruction. Mm -hmm. So I think that that, um, and the SEL world as well. I think that, you know, I think having Jess's position and really having someone be able to focus on building up those support systems is huge and crucial for kids. And so I think that that's great. Mm -hmm. So if it seems like this could kind of cast, a like a wider net could be cast by way of, of um, these new laws, are you assessing just sort of like the capacity of our existing special education staff to field that, those potential increases, and are we looking at recommended changes or increases? I just need to hire people. Libby tells me not to stress yet, but I'm a little stressed. Um, there aren't a lot of special educators out there. Right. Um, so and everybody is looking for them. Everyone's ones. looking. I know, it's not just here, it's everywhere. Yeah. Um, I think that you know, it's not going to all be in place for next year, but I think there are opportunities kind of looking more long term around specialization. So if there becomes a point where special educators are hard to find, then do we look at having them do the case, like someone specialized in just the case management piece, and then we find people that are math and literacy intervention, you know, like are there, mm -hmm. there are other mm -hmm. ways that we can be flexible to right. make sure that student needs are getting met? Um, so thinking about that stuff for sure. Um, right now, trying to think about uh, ways that people can collaborate more and like what are, who are the resources that we have right now without you know trying that first and trying to fill in those empty, vacant spots that have been vacant all year. And there, 
there will we're going to have to have some hard conversations around delivery model um and and is it working is it effective um or do just the adults like it um and uh how do we provide the services that we need like case management services and specialized instruction with what we have which is what peggy sue was just referencing and there are going to be some hard conversations most definitely um, with our staff and leaders around how to make this possible because we can't conjure up people out of thin air you know like we have We're what trying. we have yeah <laughs> we have what we have and we'll continue to, to search and all that kind of thing but um, mm -hmm. it's we, we have what we have so we got to do with the most we have with it um, so there'll be some hard conversations there'll be conversations around the um, the co-teaching at Union Elementary School can that continue based on the needs that we see from kids that's going to be very hard mm. for us to have for, for both the community and the teachers um, so but they're just where we are right now and I think the other thing that um, we're, we're looking at and people have been great the leadership team of it team has been great about this is it's not like we've always had this number of special educators at high school therefore that's what has to be here it's like looking at where are the numbers of kids right now and where do we need to shift people so that we're not burning out the wonderful people that we have and we've had to make more shifts this year than we ever ever have in my tenure how do um, kids who are English as second language fit into this and um, and do, do you provide services for them or does that funding come from somewhere else and so how many kids do we have um, we I think we have around 50, 50 something yeah um, they, we have three um, teachers whose focus um, uh, is working with those students um, they don't fall under special education unless they also have a disability um, but they uh, and there are some times where that happens um, which is always tricky to tease out but um, there's lots of great guidance around that uh, so there are three there are three teachers that have caseloads that work on supporting those students um, I work with them some it is definitely not my area of expertise they are the experts and tell me what they do uh, which is great um, I think that what we with them again it's about how do we many of the things that we could um, support classroom teachers with will also be helpful for students that English is a second language for. So, um, you know, they're looking for opportunities to also provide um, coaching to teachers and, you know, they're uh, often they're planning with teachers as well around accessibility um, from their lens and their angle versus the accessibility based on disability. But the funding is totally different. I don't actually think there's much funding specific. Uh, like, like we'll have Scott be last, and don't forget, we're going to see Peggy Sue in a couple of weeks. So <laughs> Scott will go last, and then we'll move on to our next agenda item. Thanks. I'm curious. So there's a slide, what does special education look like at MRPS? Yeah. Um, in your opinion, when, when you look at how we provide special education services here, mm -hmm. what are you like most proud of? What, what's like really exemplary? about special education services at MRPS and where do you think we really need to like where are our growth edges where where can we really improve um, I think the thing to be most proud of is that every single person I've met is doing what needs to happen for kids so super flexible staff super kid focused um, really strong special educators I mean, they've been working all year with three less professionals than they should have in their, you know, three less special educators. So, and not one time has someone said to me, that's not my job, I'm not gonna do it. It's like, all right, how are we, you know, how are we gonna figure this out? How are we gonna, you know, how are we gonna make this work? Um, so I think that um, the, the um, commitment and dedication to getting kids what they need is huge. Um, I think that as uh, when I think about what could what do we need to do I think it's that specialization thing it's that next part like and we don't like it and, and most people I, I'm trying to, I don't think I can think of anyone who's not interested in growing as a professional so it's really helping people figure out how are we going to target professional development for them so that is increasing whatever area they're interested in and or we need for the district um, this year 
our, tar our focus has definitely been on these rule changes, and you know, unfortunately, that's not necessarily about instruction. Um, so, uh, you know, there's some exciting instruction coming next year. I know about for reading um, at Union and Roxbury. Um, and I think that the conversations, I know, I don't think, the conversations I've been having with special educators as we kind of wrap up um, the year is around, so what is your target? What is, what is the area? Where are you looking to grow instructionally? Um, and I think we can all, you know, keep growing and learning as new research comes out. Um, and I see that it's, it's an awesome group of people. Like, I'm really happy to be able to work with them all. They're great. And I get to see them every week, and um, and it's all about kids. It's never about like, nope, I can't do one more. I can't like, ugh, another kid moved in. Like that, that is not what I hear. So I think that that's fantastic, and we can figure out everything else as long as we have that mindset. Great. Thank you, Peggy Sue. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks again Thank for you. being here. Absolutely. Good night. Good night. Okay. I'm going to turn it over to our Facilities and Energy Committee for the Net Zero Resolution. Great. Thanks. Uh, so before you this evening, for the first time, uh, is going is the uh, draft. I want to say it in full. Um, the draft uh, resolution to set goals for net zero facilities and operations and establish a decarbonization roadmap. Um, I sent an email to the board last week week that just gave a little bit of like a historical retrospective and some context of you know how this came to the board um, which I think originally I'm not sure if it was actually MIAC um, Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee get that right, Tim? Um, who Tim favorite is here and he is a member of MIAC and he has been incredibly helpful to the Facilities and Energy Committee in doing this work so thank you publicly for all the time and energy we appreciate you um, so MIAC has come to the board at least twice during my time um, talking about the city of Montpelier's goals around achieving net zero by 2030. Um, MIAC had also commissioned a study that was done by the EIC, the words behind that ac acronym I cannot recall. Um, however, they did um, develop an action plan for the city um, around achieving net zero. Uh, the heating systems at MS, MS, and MHS were named as target, you know, kind of priorities uh, to, to hit that 2030 goal. Um, we also heard from the Montpelier High School Earth Group in the spring of 2021, I believe it was, and they made a direct request to the board to adopt a net zero policy. Um, so those, in my time, have been kind of the primary, um, you know, drivers, you know, for the board to really kind of take this up and take a look at it. and. Um, it's taken us a minute um, to get to this work as I think the Earth Group came to the board at the time when the Facilities and Energy Committee had just uh, been created. So we've been kind of getting our bearings and centered this work really in the last six months or so. And after looking at a lot of resources out there and looking at how different school districts really from around the country were um, taking on net zero, uh, you know, fossil fuel transitions, decarbonization, et cetera. Um, one way that they were kind of starting that work was to uh, write a resolution that kind of helps define the way forward. It kind of prioritizes the work, um, you know, it sets a plan for what the work is generally going to be, um, sends a message to our constituents who are clearly very, um, you know, this is a, a topic of interest. Um, we also heard from folks in the um, thought exchange that was, I think in December of 2021, there was an infrastructure thought exchange and we got a lot of feedback from community members um, that net zero was a priority for them in terms of, um, yeah, our facilities as a district. Um, so we decided to go ahead and write a resolution, um, knowing that a policy, we weren't quite sure how to go about that because net zero is, there's a lot to be done. There's a lot to be considered. It's not simple, it's complex. So the purpose of the resolution is to really kind of carve out, you know, the, the way forward and the next steps for the board, um, while also, you know, making mention of just the, the context of uh, science, things happening in the city of Montpelier, in the state of Vermont, um, really in, you know, in the world in terms of um, climate change and climate emergency, whatever you might call it. Um, so we really kind of tried to mention those things in our 
um, or preamble, all of the whereases <laughs> of the resolution. Um, and um, within the resolution, we get into you know setting that um, that goal of net zero facilities and operations by 2030, um, which uh, you know and kind of teaming up with the, the city, you know what they are considering net zero is really eliminating um, fossil fuels uh, as a source for um, heating and transportation. Um, and then we talk a bit about hopefully you've all read it. <laughs> uh, you know we talk about the need for kind of a a decarbonization plan, like a way in which that we would go about, um, you know, doing this, doing this work. You know, we've worked co closely with Andrew um, Larosa and getting his feedback. And I think something that Andrew has asked of us is, you know, how do I make these decisions? There's many decisions to make in terms of keeping our, you know, facilities up and running and up to snuff. And there's repairs that need to be made. How do I go about making a decision and pulling in, you know, the net zero goal piece? Like he's asking for some guidance from us to do that, um, because there are dollars and cents attached to all of those decisions. So, um, so in this resolution, uh, you know, it, it really just kind of makes carves the way for us to do that work in developing um, a framework, a roadmap, and also um, kind of like a tool sort of like similar to the equity policy review tool that, um, you know, if we have to make, if there's a certain decision before, you know, facilities, you know, would would a decision made kind of, you know, check the boxes and be aligned with the net zero goals of the district. So that's what we've been talking about creating. Um, you know, in developing this, we also were sure to get feedback from the, uh, the student earth group from, uh, we had comment from Sam Lash from, Community Vermont Regional Planning Commission, I believe it is. And so she's also been very helpful with us in um, just giving guidance and also providing the context around funding opportunities. I think um, we're not talking about things that are um, cheap in terms of making changes. So um, Sam has been helpful to us to let us know kind of what the funding landscape is looking like right now and grant opportunities um, so that you know, if when it comes to the time that we're talking about making these ch changes, how could they be supported by outside funds that are not taxpayer um, dollars? So, um, and yeah, we really just wanted to get it before you all tonight to get some feedback and response and direction. Um, and we have it on the agenda, I think for next, for the next meeting, but then I also saw it on the, um, I think the May meeting with the sustainability student group, which does kind of dovetail nicely but um, for tonight we just really want to get some initial impressions and feedback on the draft resolution great thank you mm -hmm. open it up for any comments or questions I want to give a huge shout out to Kristen for leading our committee in this work We've um, done a really amazing job, and it's something that's sort of been, you know, discussed by the community and by students for a very long time now. And to see the type of progress we've been able to make uh, since you've been sort of at the helm is really impressive. So thank you so much for your work. And also, Tim has been really like an honorary extra committee member Without attending all the glamour that comes with being a committee <laughs> member yeah. so really <laughs> big props yeah. to you for that he's been bringing a lot of expertise to our yeah. discussion and helping answer lots of questions and attending every meeting so it's really yeah, that's um, huge you know he deserves a huge thank you for all of that work Twenty thirty. <laughs> dun, dun. It's good to be optimistic. <laughs> well, what's the biggest, what's the biggest dollar punch to the net zero? You know, what's the biggest, what's the big one? Or two or three, I mean, heating systems um, and Yes, heating systems. Um, so for all for all the schools, or no, I guess RDS is heat pumps. That's nice. Yep. Yeah. Currently, I mean, what's was identified in the VEIC report, um, the Net Zero Action Plan for the city, or the oil-based heating systems at Montpelier Main Street Middle School and then Montpelier High School. 
um, in the report there was two um, strategies you know that could be looked at there was the idea of um, doing some wood boiler systems and then there was also um, ground source heat pump systems um, Interestingly, it does seem like there is some backing away from the idea of wood chip um, boiler systems, just the general kind of discussion and narrative around them. Um, you know, folks are, are walking back from that. You know, is it a sustainable source? You know, looking at, at you know, the carbon emissions piece, does it really balance out? Um, so it seems like the trend in the sector is definitely like electrification, electrification, electrification is like a lot of what's, you know, being talked about. So like heat pumps, you know, is like kind of the new technology. Um, so I'm not a professional in this, you know, I'm a, I'm a, what do we call that? Uh, armchair quarterback or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so I think we're all learning and that's also what's in here is that, you know, in this process that we would have, you know, a committee that would take it on like to really learn about this so that, um, you know, a sensible plan could be made. And there has been a lot of discussion of like, right, like time moves on so the technology changes over time. You know, what worked, you know, However, many years ago, we didn't have seatbelts. You know, now we have seatbelts, right? We have airbags. So it's the technology keeps changing. So, you know, that's certainly a part of the discussion because this is, um, you know, would be a financial investment wherever, you know, the money comes from. So, but 2030, sorry, just it was, you know, really, um, you know, we're trying to stay kind of in sync with the city of Montpelier that established a 2030 goal. So that's where that came from. And the other big piece, it was sort of mostly twofold. It was like heating systems and transportation. Yes. Yeah. So our buses being electrified somehow. So we'll, we'll have to see. I mean, the Inflation Act, yes. does that have a time frame? Because that was a tremendous amount of yeah. federal resources that I don't know. I don't know. But... Tim, there's a lot of resources. Because that is what Sam has been saying, that there's a lot of funding kind of packed inside of that that is, um, could be accessible. Right, there, yeah, there's a number of, yeah, there's a lot of money coming out in the next, you know, couple of years, I believe, um, that, that should open up. But like I think, yeah, with Libby and Andrew already found one that, you know, that seemed promising well, that didn't pan out, but I'm sure there will be others. Does Montpelier own its buses, or do we contract out for that? So the committee is looking for any feedback from the board on the, res the resolution itself to take back to a committee meeting to maybe make some edits. That's right. Great. Oh, oh I had raised my hand. Yep. I, I, don't wanna, I think another piece to Rhett's question that I remember hearing Andrew say in the past is there's also a lot of like, if there isn't just like one or two like huge things, there's also like a bunch of little things that may not seem as glamorous or as obvious, right? Like replacing light bulbs that are a different way or like repairing something and making it last longer that there are like other less exciting moves that could be part of that like strategy about windows kind of like yes yeah. yes exactly mm -hmm. um and i i would say about that i mean i i think andrew's made a ton of strides in those departments across the district too. I mean, I know there's been huge lighting retrofits and, you know, and I know that a lot of those are showing up in the facilities, the annual facilities report that um, he's kind of separating out and putting like a, uh, I forget what he calls it, like a green technology section kind of within that so we can sort of see, you know, where those conservation measures are being built into facilities upgrades too. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, conservation, you know, not as glamorous, but, you know, is also important. I just had a few comments, which right. one was the goal is really impressive, um, strong and ambitious, and that, that's, I think that's great. And I think it makes sense because that it's uh, aligned with what the city of Montpelier is doing since three of our buildings are located in <laughs> inside of Montpelier. Um, I also really appreciate that you have defined what net zero looks like for us because that's often been the question that gets raised when people come to us and say we need you to get to net zero or we need you to work toward zero, um, net zero. And for us to be able to say this is what it looks like for us, even if it's not, you know, what's some other district or some other 
entity would define it as. Um, I think it has like to to define it for us gives us the thing to be working toward, which is really really helpful. Um, one of the questions that I had while I was reading it that I think is answered at the end was just how we're going to hold ourselves accountable into what we're doing. But I think one of the resolutions has the, um, you know, at least annually we will be yep. monitoring our own progress. So I appreciate seeing that. And then I also had a question about how it impacts our budget, which I realize is not possible to answer today, but I wonder if it's worth working it into the resolution somehow. A, I don't know, just to acknowledge that we don't have all of the money that it would take to pay for these things right now. And maybe we never will. I don't know, like, it's, that's the, that's mm -hmm. a tricky part of doing this and feels like maybe worth including in the resolution somehow to talk about, acknowledge the financial piece. I think one area that we, we address it somewhat, and you can you know tell me if if you know if, if it wants to be more, because I get it that that is a that is a glaring reality, right? Is the cost of which and the fact that our budget relies on taxpayer money. Um, in the second, uh, be it resolved, uh, you know, we talk about just changes that would be made would you know be made based upon reasonability within budgetary. Mm -hmm. It mentions that, so mm -hmm. it doesn't really get specific beyond that however right. that, that that is an important variable in any kind of decision making um, but um, yeah I've made a note I'll think about it yeah I don't think it says anything about external funding um, does it I thought we had put that in there um, I think we had uh, in a whereas section the last, whereas, uh, there, whereas as of 2023, there are unprecedented federal funding opportunities available for energy infrastructure upgrades. Um, so we, we name that the, you know, the funding environment right now is more flush than usual. <laughs> um, but let me, um, let me go back through and see external funding. I mean, I think that that's a Yeah, a pursuit of, yeah. Mm -hmm. In terms of where we are now, how do we move forward and take advantage of that funding? You know that's what I mean? Because it's not going to be there the good, good <laughs> forever. The big bucks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Andrew's always on the lookout. And the Agency of Education with Jill B Briggs Campbell, who's one of our parents. We are lucky to have her as one of our parents gives us the heads up as well when the state learns of she works at the agency of education in this world um, and she gives us a heads up when grants are coming along yeah she's awesome and you feel like you're at, at a point or maybe this is a question for andrew i don't know but that if that kind of funding comes up we can jump on it and andrew's very good at that so what tim was alluding to was a monster grant opportunity that he we learned about in a meeting and I think grant had a, or Andrew had a proposal for it within a week to get out there so he he's pretty quick like um, that yeah great we didn't get it however <laughs> Gosh. anybody else Anybody else Questions or input? You look like you have a thought. I know. Scott. Something's brewing. I, I have a question that is related, but not specifically to this. Okay. And so I want to hold it to the end and then maybe pop in. Yeah. The end of the whole meeting? No, the oh, end of this. This the part of the agenda. I think we're there. Okay. Yeah, I think we're there. So yeah. I am I'm thinking about like the landscape of the role of a board and I'm curious what like I understand what a policy is and does but what is a resolution and yeah like yes we have wondered the same um, because I think according to Jim like this may be a first um, time at least in time yeah, memorial <laughs> that a, a resolution has been created by the board um, so um, 
and again, we kind of looked at literally nationwide, you know, different, you know, there was, there was more resolutions than there were policies, you know, adopted by school districts. So, I mean, my sense is that, right, like if it's a policy, if there's going to be compliance reporting, it's, you know, it's binding, you know, whereas I feel like the resolution is like making a, a value statement and, and for this, the purpose is here really um, setting a direction for the work, you know, and being clearly articulating, you know, what these kind of next steps are and how we as a board are going to work to carry that work forward kind of in response to, you know, community members. Um, so I think there probably is a bit of honor system, <laughs> you know, in this and, you know, that we have a facilities and energy committee and that this, you know, will be on the work plan of that committee to keep it, to keep it going forward. And that's why we did build in like an annual, you know, again, it's going to be honor system, but an annual, you know, update for the board, uh, you know, where, where we're at in, in achieving this goal. So I don't know. There could just be it's new territory. I see it as a first step too. It's like yeah. this is us, you know, committing to um, to this as a value and to work towards it. And then if it doesn't seem like we're on track, then maybe a policy would be in order, you know, eventually. Seems like a good guiding principles kind of for mm -hmm. us to keep in mind when we're making our decisions and choices. Merrick? I have a question. Um, Great. Were any of the like school environmental groups, like the high school work group, um, like conferred with about the yes. resolution? Okay. Yeah. So um, I went to an earth group meeting and kind of just gave them an overview on where we were at and in the process. Um, and then uh, the draft resolution was provided to them to review. Um, they gave us um, some written feedback and they were also invited to kind of like a reviewer meeting um, where folks just around the table kind of shared you know, their feedback and we had two members uh, attend uh, that meeting and then I also gave the second resolution to those folks and I did share it with um, Tom Sabo who's the coordinator for the Earth Group and I just, I did it today which I I meant to get it to him last week. It just got lost in the shuffle. But we do have additional time to hear from. It's not being, you know, it's not up for approval tonight. But um, I'll follow up with Tom again to make sure that for sure they've seen it. Uh, yeah, great. That was what yeah. I was wondering. Yeah. There yeah. was and feedback, yep. right? But it sounds like there was. So. Yeah. yeah. Also, the you know, really the origin story of the work that started with the board kind of, um, I mean, I'm sure there were rumblings about it prior to that big Earth Group presentation. Mm -hmm. But when they, when the student group presented to us, how many years ago? It was March of 2020. Two, I think it was my first years. meeting. I think, or two second meeting. Ago. So yeah, 2021. So when, when that presentation happened, I feel like that was really the, like, the impetus to move this work forward more quickly. So I, I would attribute the momentum around this topic uh, directly to the students that gave that presentation that day. So I think the next step then is to take any feedback and then, you know, we may be coming back to the next meeting for approval. So anything between now and then, please follow up with us and um, we'll get it to you in advance of the next meeting. Great. Thank nice. you again yeah. for the great work. Okay, so now we're moving on to monitoring two policies the one on budget execution and the one on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and this uh, requires board action to approve the monitoring reports. I have a motion? I move to approve the two monitoring reports. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second that. Right. Any discussion? I yep. want to, oh, oh yep. sorry. <laughs> I just want to thank Libby again for just um, sort of an honest assessment of the diversity, equity, and inclusion yeah. policy and being willing to say that we have work to do there, um, you know, publicly in, in that capacity. So thank I appreciate it. Thank you, Tim. And remind us of things we have done, like the, yeah. uh, you know, support we gave to the statewide mm -hmm. waiting work, at, you know equitable eight waiting work yeah and giving very specific detailed explanation of sort of like where what we've done and, and what we need to do yeah the work that we're going to be doing so thank yeah. you for that 
Kristen, did you have something? Yeah, I, um, in some ways it was a little bit more of a, a, a question or comment for the board. You know, I mean, part of that policy is, is a board responsibility um, in terms of, you know, asks the board to, I think, do like an annual review of policies like with an equity lens. You know, we haven't done that work in a concerted way. The equity committee did create a policy review tool, but then didn't actually do kind of a full sweep of all the policies. Um, so I was just thinking about that in terms of what pieces does the board need to take on um, in terms of that piece. And then I think we're, I, we're also responsible for training, or, right? We need to do a training for ourselves. Right, so, and I know we have one coming up, but, um, so yeah, I was just specifically thinking about the policy review, and this is maybe like a question down the line for the policy committee, and kind of where that process is, and maybe a question also for the equity committee of how, you know, do we taking another look at that equi equity policy review tool and thinking about how that could be kind of leveraged in that process that we have not yet completed or started, for that matter. So. Um. I will say that we have been using the equity oh, great. Um, tool. Great. And we actually just, at, at our after our last meeting, we decided, and I know we, we spoke of that tool as being sort of a living document that could be changed. So what we're going to try to do for our next round of required policies that Rhett mentioned, there's three of them, um, is where we transferred that tool into a Google form mm -hmm. because we were finding it a little challenging, even just like sort of like little technical formatting issues yeah. mm -hmm. of like losing the headers while you're typing down below and then having to go back and, and read the headers. <laughs> so just stuff like that. Yeah. And, and so totally. we, we put it in, we transcribed it into a Google form to hopefully make it more user friendly and we're going to practice <laughs> using it and see how that works out. That's but, um, fabulous. But we have been using it. I mean, I will say that um, to do a full read with that tool of all of our policies would be very, very time consuming. And we've been, you know, we've been doing it as we go. So we did it with the library policy and we did it with the five new board policies. And we're doing it now with these three. So like we're using it as we go. Mm -hmm. But if we wanted to uh, make a more concerted effort to go through, you know, all the policies we might need to start spreading the love into other committees mm -hmm. <laughs> for that work. Um, but so far, I think it's been a helpful tool to, Great. to start. Great. You know, it's a, starting, a good starting point. That makes me wonder if it would be worth tweaking the language in the DEI policy a bit to say, you use, you look, at every, look at every policy that is up for renewal, when, when up for renewal, or when yeah. getting written. Right through the equity lens because right. rather, rather than tasking us with got to look at every single policy annually, unless That's it was lot. like maybe we asked when you do policy monitoring reports, we, there were like three key questions we asked you to answer that were drawn from that tool or brought in the next always lens. work out. I mean, yeah. mileage. Yeah, or <laughs> right. and, and like something like firearms also. Yeah. Right, so that's another reason I wonder if it's worth tweaking the language a bit yeah. to maintain the spirit of what is there, which mm -hmm. yes. makes a lot of sense, but not have it be, okay, we're not, we haven't looked at every single policy this year, so therefore we're not in compliance with right. this particular policy. I think that's a great suggestion. Um, it, the DEI policy is one of the policies that's on our list of priority right. policies to work on, and it's something that Zach and Merrick have been working on um, in their tenure as student reps. So they've been sort of honing in on the curriculum piece of it, um, but I would imagine we're kind of waiting for um, new guidance from the state on DEI, and once that comes down, I think we'll be ready to mm. uh, take another look at our DEI mm -hmm. policy, at which point we could review that piece. Yeah. Yeah, the other piece to look at that I'm every year I'm like I don't know how to do that is the self-identifying factors and how would I report out to the board data around self like LGBTQ plus um, we certainly don't disaggregate our reading and math data along that identifying factor nor could we so it's just something else to yeah. to think about. Any other discussion? on these policy monitoring reports. All 
All right. All those in favor of approval? Aye. 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 Any opposed? I think that's it. Thanks, everybody. Motion to adjourn? So moved. Oh, it's a tie. We'll let Anna figure <laughs> out who said corner. it. I got the last one. Uh, second? I second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye.